Hello, good evening. Chaos is a word invented by ancient Greeks to describe a situation where no rules apply. Ancient Greeks are important for Western culture because we treat, we understand them as the originators of rational thought. And at the very beginning of rational thought in our history, we have already faced a situation where we were unable to understand a single thing going on in a particular system. So already ancient Greeks were faced with chaotic systems, and they were unable to handle such things. For ages, literally thousands of years, chaos has been thought as something bad. We don't understand what's going on. If we don't understand, we, are, we feel as if we were in a dark forest where something can jump out of darkness and harm us or ultimately eat us. So the 20th century, all right, the 19th century already has found a way to treat chaos and to understand the rules of chaos. And today I would like to, to make two simple abstract demonstrations of this. So first let's settle down with the notion of chaos. There, there are various possibilities to understand what chaos is. A state of a system in which no rules apply, or a state of a system where we are unable to determine the rules, or a random state of a system. So, uh, me being a mathematician, I will focus on this understanding of chaos. So, for me, a chaotic situation is something that is random. And because it's random, I don't know what's going on. Whoops. However, chaos is capable of spontaneous self-organization. That's the thesis that I would like to defend this evening. The most important, the most fundamental theory of modern science, the theory of the origins of lives, actually is based on this premise that uh, life happened spontaneously. There was a huge soup, primordial soup, where elements were boiling and boiling, and suddenly some organization some organization took place. This is also the weakest point of evolution theory, because how can something self-organize? How can a non-living matter self-organize? Well, surprisingly, there is an article from 2014 by Jeremy England, a young MIT physicist, who actually proved, starting from the general accepted rules of thermodynamics that if you have a huge amount of particles and just two assumptions, there is an external source of energy, like sun, and this uh, amount, th these particles are embedded in a bath heat, in a heat bath, like C, they will tend to organize in a way that displays um, certain properties pertinent to living, uh, to, to, to living things. So you see, there is a thermodynamical definition of life. Living creatures can be distinguished from non-living nature simply by the fact that we dissipate a lot of energy, much more energy than the non-living nature. For example, 100 kilograms of Homo sapiens dissipates so much energy in comparison to 100 kilograms of stone. See? And actually what, Jimmy, uh, what uh, Jeremy Anglin showed is that if you have just a random arrangement of molecules with the external source of energy embedded in a, a heat bath, it will start to organize in such a way that it uh, starts to dissipate a lot of energy in comparison to the non-living nature. Okay. Another example comes from technology. 
So there is an article, a recent article, see, published in March 2017, two months ago, which says that chaos leads to stronger carbon fiber. You just have to bake the carbon in the right conditions. So in technology, if we want to make carbon fibers, uh, the best thing to make the strongest carbon, ki carbon fibers we can is to simply let the chaos do the job. So since I'm not an expert on thermod thermodynamics and I'm not an expert in technology, I will uh, go to the field that I feel confident in, it's mathematics. And I'll actually demonstrate very simply that chaos can organize. Uh, <clears throat> the thesis that I'm going to de uh, defend on a more technical level claims the following. If you have a limited means of combining things and you allow yourself to have a huge structure, then regular patterns will appear spontaneously. Okay. So this is going to be a thought experiment, like Einstein's thought experiment, an abstract one. So I will not talk about biology or physics because I know nothing about biology or physics and physics. <clears throat> I will talk about a very abstract setting. My universe will consist of n particles. And let's de 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 denote th this universe uh, uh, by k sub n, which means a complete system with n particles. It means that these particles, each pair of particles may or may not interact. This is the universe I will consider. Then, what will be the interactions? So, some of the lines will be red and the others will be blue. And I will let this coloring be random. So take a huge universe with n particles, each pair of paired particles may interact, and some interactions are red, the others are blue. That's the random universe, but n is going to be very, very big, huge. I will show later on some uh, ex concrete examples. Now, what will be the regular parts of the universe? By regular parts, I will consider monochromatic uh, subsystems. Okay, so this is monochromatic K5. Monochromatic means all the interactions are, are of the same kind, all red or all blue, okay? Now, there is a theorem. Now, theorems are mathemat mathematical facts. This is a true statement in mathematics. It may or may not relate to everyday life because some parts of mathematics are somehow have left our reality and now form a uh, how shall I put it? Um, have a life which is not always possible to interpret in everyday conditions. So there is a theorem which tells the following. For every integer n, so no matter how large the universe is, take any coloring of those lines. So take an arbitrary random universe with n edges, with n particles. There will be a monochromatic subsystem of, of, of the logarithmic size. You, you, you've heard of logarithms, I guess. This is a somewhat technical statement, okay? But let's uh, take a, an example. Consider a universe, a complete universe, with six times 10 to the 23rd particles. Are you familiar with this, with this number? Chemistry. Second grade, I guess. When I went to school, we had to face this number already in the second grade. What's this number called? Avogadro's number, thank you. What's, what's that? What's the Avogadro's number? It's the amount of molecules in, in a mole of substance, okay? So you just take one mole of substance. It's a tiny, tiny amount of substance. Take one mole of substance. If you take the universe, the size of a mole of substance, you will get a monochromatic K29. There will be 29 points interacting with, with each other in the same way. So already in one mole of substance, now this 29 does, may not seem spectacular, but you see, the fact that you have to take into account is that this is a random thing. This is a chaotic phenomenon. Take, take one mole of substance in an arbitrary setting. 
you will have at least 29 particles interacting in a, in, in a very, in a highly organized way. Now imagine the primordial soup, an entire ocean covering the planet. How much substance is there? I don't know. It's enormous. This number will also become enormous. In a huge ocean of, of substance, you will have large, very, very well organized portions. So you see, this is a famous result from actually the, the, the 20th century. This is called the Ramsey's theorem. After British mathematician called Frank Plumpton Ramsey, who proved the first result of this kind in 1920s. So this is a rather recent phenomenon in modern science. All right. Now everything was finite here, and may maybe you are not fascinated by these numbers. So let's see what goes on in the infinite. Now, you see, what I try to convey in this little example is that as the number of particles increase, the number of self-organizing parts of that subsystem will also increase. It will increase logarithmically, but it will increase and it may reach very large, uh, very, very large scales. Now, what mathematics likes very much is to consider the infinite situations. And now, a variant of this, but in a different setting, will be our second example. Uh-huh. Okay, ocean of randomness. Okay, let's consider a second example. Take the positive integers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and, all, and so on. Take all the positive integers and take a coin. This coin doesn't have to be a fair coin. So when you flip it, you don't have to expect the 50-50 outcome of heads and tails. Just take any coin. It may be an unfair coin. And for each pair of integers, flip a coin. So let's say we consider one and two, and then we flip a coin, and if we end up with heads, we'll just connect these two dots. If we end up with, fail, uh, with tails, we'll simply leave the, the, the two dots not uh, disconnected. Okay. Then take one and three, flip the coin, and let's say we decide to connect the dots again. Then take two and three, flip the coin again, and let's say that the coin tells us not to connect these dots. And so on. We flip a coin and connect the dots or don't connect the dots. And we end up with a huge structure. Okay. Some random structure. That's chaotic. We have no idea what goes on inside. Okay. Now, we flip the coin and we ended up with a structure G1. Now, flip the coin, start the process again. Start again from the empty graph, from the empty set of, um, uh, from all the integers, and start flipping the coin again. Then something else will happen. We will end up with a different structure. So you have one completely random structure and another completely random structure. And you can actually change the coin. You can produce the second structure by a different coin, which may not, which is not expected to be fair. Let's say that the outcome of the for, for the first coin is 54, um, uh, 49% to 51%, and the outcome for the second coin is 60% against 40%, or whatever. Now, a very deep result in mathematics tells us the following. These two structures are almost surely the same thing. With probability one, these two things are identical. So you take two completely random processes on an infinite set of points, so if the universe is infinite, it will always have the same structure. This is why we truly believe that our universe is finite, but we don't know. So these two completely random processes will end up with the same structure. Moreover, so this coin flip structure is called the random graph. These structures are called graphs, it's a technical term, and it's called random because we were simply flipping the coin and deciding basically on, with no rules at all whether to connect the two points or not. The random graph is now extremely important because this is how the internet behaves. 
modern models of the of larger networks in the internet or uh, social networks like Twitter or Facebook or whatever, they tend to behave like this structure. Okay. And the final thing that I would like to mention is that, you see, this random graph, this flip coin graph, is not always, this procedure not always produces the same structure, but this structure is ultra symmetric. So you see, you, you may end up, maybe, yes, we get the same structure, but this is something ugly or something, you know, that we cannot handle. However, even that is not the case. This random structure is extremely symmetric. It's the most symmetric thing you can build on the integers one, two, three, all the way, and so on. So this is a result from 1963. So it's a very recent mathematical discovery that random things in mathematics can display surprisingly complex behavior, can organize and can, by, by random processes, you can build extremely symmetric structures. So, uh, going back to thermodynamics, but just for a couple of seconds, you've all, you've all probably heard of the notion entropy. You see, highly organized systems tend to deteriorate in its organization. It's called entropy. However, there is a dual notion as well. Highly disorganized systems, chaotic systems, tend to self-organize. So this is a rather recent discovery in abstract sciences like mathematics, and based on this discovery, as we have seen, many uh, technological, many things in technology actually are gaining, and we end up with this strange phenomenon that somehow we have a mathematical proof that a primordial soup, which existed several million years ago on Earth, may end up with a highly organized, with highly organized parts, and who knows what happened afterwards. Thank you very much.